All right, folks, good afternoon to everybody. Happy Tuesday after Memorial Day. Uh, my name is Jeff Yeagley with Compass IT Compliance, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Uh, we'll be discussing the changes to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Before I go ahead and introduce our presenter today, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first thing is, is that everybody's line has been muted to minimize any distractions during the presentation. However, with that being said, we will have time for a Q&A session at the end. So if you do have any questions, there's a couple ways that you can go ahead and do that. Uh, there's a chat panel where you can go ahead and you can address the questions either to the group or directly to me. Again, my name is Jeff with Compass IT Compliance. Uh, there's also a Q&A section as well where you can go ahead and enter in information uh, and questions in there and we can answer those time permitting. Uh, the next piece is, is that we are recording the webinar. So we will make that available uh, upon conclusion of the webinar and send that out to everybody as well as a copy of the presentation. Uh, so that'll come out to you in an email either later today or first thing tomorrow morning, uh, in addition to a, a link to view the recording of the webinar, or you can share that with anybody that um, you would like to share that with. So I think that covers most of the, the housekeeping items. Uh, I'm going to introduce today's presenter for our webinar, and today's presenter is Kyle Dawn. So Kyle's an IT auditor with Compass IT Compliance. He's been with us for a couple of years. He's also a certified information systems auditor. So Kyle has extensive experience in working with clients across a number of different vertical markets, including healthcare, government, retail, and uh, merchant, uh, people that accept credit cards as a form of payment, to assist them with a variety of different uh, compliance and security initiatives, and one of those being working to help them assess against and implement the NIST cybersecurity framework. So Kyle has a wealth of information that I know uh, he's looking forward to sharing with you guys. So with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Kyle to go ahead and uh, start the presentation. Take it away, Kyle. All right. Appreciate it, Jeff, and thanks, everyone, for sacrificing your first Tuesday back from a long weekend, and hopefully everybody had a good Memorial Day weekend. Um, so let's get things going. So for the agenda today, uh, I'm going to discuss just in general what is the NIST cybersecurity framework um, before we talk about any of the changes, why it was established, um, what the framework has changed, what are the specific changes to it, and you know, what does that mean for your company? If you have questions about that, put it into the um, Q&A with Jeff and we'll answer some questions at the end, uh, time permitting, like he said. So the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, it was released in February of 2014 by uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. If nobody knew what NIST stood for, that's what it is. Um, you can find them at uh, nist.gov, super easy. Uh, the framework consists of standards, guidelines, best practices to manage your cybersecurity risk. So with that being said, it's not, um, it's not a requirement to actually go and do these things. It's just a guideline that can assist different organizations on how to better secure their information that they have. Uh, the controls are designed to be prioritized, flexible, repeatable, cost-effective across multiple different verticals. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be applied to government agencies. It could be applied to private businesses uh, or manufacturers, healthcare, whatever it is. It's just different standards and best practices on how to protect uh, your information. So the framework is outlined into the five different functions, uh, and I'm going to go over those uh, real quick, a high-level uh, overview of them. It's, we have the five functions, 23 categories, and 102 subcategories. So when you see this, you're thinking, oh my gosh, there's a ton of different things that are going to get drilled into. Um, the, net, the first section being the identify section where we go through and we identify what are the different types of um, information that we're having to then going into what, how are we going to protect those things, 
uh, the detection mechanisms that are in place to detect if a cybersecurity event were to occur, whether it being an IDS or an IPS, um, having uh, logs in place, different things like that. And then it moves into the fourth category of respond. So if anything were to ever happen and a cybersecurity event did occur, what are our response um, what are our response guidelines? Who do we need to um, be reporting to? Uh, if there's any state, local, or government agencies that we need to contact due to the type of information that we have uh, that might have been breached. And then once the response, uh, the response section has been completed and the incident is no longer a threat, we'll go into the recover. Recover is um, actually pretty short. Uh, it just goes over different high-level things like uh, how do we respond to our customers or the media? Are we having somebody in front of the news cameras identifying different things like that? Um, informing uh, our board members, stakeholders, different things. So the functions organize cybersecurity activities at their highest level. Uh, the categories divide the functions into groups so it's better to understand them instead of trying to put all 102 different controls into, uh, into place. They break it out into different categories, uh, different functions, categories, and then subcategories. And the specific subcategories, you're trying to get uh, a specific outcome. So one of them being, um, like I said, in the recover phase, who is going to be the face of the company? Who, who is the person in your organization that will be the person notifying people through social media, um, through news outlets, whatever it is? Having that specific person identified uh, is a big deal for, uh, for NIST. So breaking this out, each function contains their categories and subcategories. Like I said, identify has six categories with 23 subcategories. Um, in identify, we have asset management, where the data, personnel, devices, systems, uh, facilities that enable your organization to achieve business purposes are identified, they're managed, with their importance to the business objectives and the organization's risk strategy. Uh, we have the business environment. Uh, this is the organization's mission, objectives, activities are understood and prioritized. Uh, the information is used to inform cybersecurity roles and responsibilities and risk management decisions. And then also in there we have governance. Uh, these are the policies and procedures. Um, this focuses a lot on policies and procedures uh, and processes that manage and monitor the organization's um, legal risk, regulatory risk, environmental operational requirements, and that they're understood and that the management, especially of an organization, understands uh, the cybersecurity risk. And then the fourth one is risk assessment. The organization understands that uh, cybersecurity risks to organizational operations, including the mission functions, image and reputation, organizational assets and individuals are all understood and encompassed in this risk assessment. And then the final category is risk management strategies. And this is the organization's priorities, constraints, risk tolerances and assumptions are established and used to support operational risk decisions. So identify and protect are the two largest of the five different category or the five functions. Um, they're broken out 12 categories. It encompasses, it looks like 62 uh, different subcategories. So that's the majority of everything within NIST is in the identify and the protect because we have to first identify what our different assets are that we need to protect <laughs> exactly and then it goes into the protect of how are we going to protect those 
Um, the first one being access control. Access to assets and facilities is limited to only authorized uh, personnel, processes, or devices, and to authorized activities and transactions. So it doesn't focus necessarily on physical controls, making sure that only people have access to certain facilities, but also those logical controls, making sure that if you have a third party vendor that has VPN access, that that access is monitored and only in use when it's necessary, that they don't have, you know, a, a back door into your environment uh, that's not being monitored or known. If they can just access whenever they feel like it, uh, it needs to be outlined in a contract somewhere, giving it a business justification. Uh, the second one is awareness and training, organizational personnel and partners. Uh, they receive cybersecurity awareness uh, education and are trained to perform their security roles and duties and responsibilities consistent with uh, policies and procedures that have been in place by the organization. Uh, I know for PCI specifically, they have PCI uh, cardholder data security awareness training to make sure that their users understand the importance of how to protect people's credit card information. And so making sure that your organization has a good cybersecurity awareness program, which would encompass you know, possible social engineering where we're having unauthorized access to a building or phishing emails. That's that's an easy one that can be sent out to people to test to see if, you know, an organization's $100 iPad giveaway or whatever it is, if people, if your users are clicking on that, um, we need to definitely make sure that we have a lot of training on the dangers of uh, clicking on those unknown links. Uh, the third one is data security. Uh, information and records are managed consistent with the organization's risk strategy to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. So, you know, we have all of this different data and that we have uh, a data classification because, you know, in our organization, there might be things that only the executives need to see versus this can go out onto our Facebook page. Being able to identify and classify uh, different types of data is very important as well. Uh, the fourth one is, <coughs> excuse me, information protection process and procedures, um, security policies that address the purpose, scope, roles, and responsibilities, uh, management commitment. Um, coordination among organizational entities, their processes and procedures. Uh, they're maintained and used to manage and protect information systems and assets. Uh, if we have a policy or a procedure and it's developed, you know, in 2018, that's great. But if we don't update these policies or procedures, you know, as our environment evolves and gets bigger or grows smaller, whichever one, uh, happens if we don't review these policies and procedures, you know, four down, four years down the road, they might not be relevant to the things um, that are occurring within the organization. So making sure that uh, policies, procedures, processes are reviewed um, at a minimum annually and at least whenever there's a, a change to the environment that would affect the policy. Uh, the fifth one, we're going into maintenance, maintenance and repairs of control and information systems is performed consistent with your policies and procedures. So if something needs to be repaired, a patch, we have a patch management policy that people aren't going in there and just applying a patch right when they see it. Or if that's what your policy is, that people make are making sure that the patch is immediately applied and it's not sitting in a queue for 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it is. As long, whatever you identify in your policies and procedures, that your workforce members understand and abide to those rules that are outlined in it. Uh, and then the last one is protective technologies. Uh, these are technical security solutions are managed to ensure that the security and the resilience of systems and assets are consistent with our policies and procedures and agreements. Um, 
sort of going back into the making sure everything that we have implemented, there's a policy, a procedure, um, a process in place that's been signed off on by upper level management that's running the organization so that uh, workers understand the guidance and the direction that a company would like to go. Uh, the third function is detect. This is a little short one. We have three categories. The first one being anomalies that we need to uh, detect anomalies and events and anomalous activities are detected in a timely manner and potential impact of events are understood. So it doesn't make any sense to have, you know, an IDS in place and it's generating logs and sending alerts, but these alerts are being sent to an email that nobody ever reads or looks at. Uh, it's almost it's almost worse to have that in place and nobody checking it because it gives people a false sense of security uh, versus, you know, I have an IDS that is sending me alerts and that's being reviewed by somebody within the organization in a timely manner. And if we need to escalate different procedures, then we, um, we can do that in a timely manner. Uh, the second one is security is continuous and security continuous monitoring. The information systems and assets are monitored at discrete intervals to identify cybersecurity events and verify the effectiveness, effectiveness of protective measures. So if we have, going back to the IDS, if we have it set up that it's giving false positives that anytime something, anything that traverses, let's say a firewall, it's getting an alert. People are going to get used to, oh, I just get this email and it sort of goes back to the boy who cries wolf that I get an alert and I just ignore it because it happens so often. So establishing different thresholds and testing uh, whatever monitoring devices you have in place uh, is very important as well. And then the detection process is the third one. And the detection process and procedures are maintained, they're tested, um, and those are to ensure that timely and adequate awareness of uh, events uh, are identified within the organization. All right, so the fourth uh, function is respond. There's five categories. It's this is going to be the first one where response planning is the first category and the response and process and procedures are executed and maintained to ensure that the timely response is detected in a cybersecurity event. Um, so understanding what our incident response plan is, um, who are the people that are on this team practicing and understanding what it is. Um, when I go out to client sites, I try to explain it like it's when we were kids, we would go to school and we would practice fire drills however many times a year. And every time that I practice a fire drill in all the years that I went to school, there was never a fire at my school, but we had our processes and procedures in place on what happens if this event were to occur. Uh, the second one is communications. Response activities are co coordinated with internal and external stakeholders as appropriate to include external support from law enforcement agencies. So it's not necessary that every event or incident needs to involve the police, but you know, there might be those specific times where uh, if your organization deals with certain types of data, or if you have a workforce member doing illicit things that, uh, warrant contacting either local, state, or federal um, authorities that we understand who these point of contacts are and that we have good contact uh, information with them. And it goes back into the importance of updating our policies and, well, our policies and procedures, reviewing those yearly, but also our incident response plan because numbers do change if there's a specific person on say a task force or whatever it is, making sure that that uh, officer or agent's name is updated um, accordingly whenever we do our testing or review of the incident response plan. 
The third one is analysis is conducted to ensure adequate response and support recovery activities. And then mitigation. Mitigation activities are performed to prevent expansion of an event, mitigate its effects, and eradicate the incident. Because if we identified our cybersecurity event and we don't completely eradicate what has happened, uh, whether it be a ransomware that spreads through our environment, if we happen to miss some of it, it will initiate another cybersecurity event and it might not just might not necessarily be a new one, but it's piggybacking off of that original one because um, as an organization, we haven't completed our entire process of mitigation and also um, identifying all the possible uh, what is it the possible devices that may have been affected. And then the last one for the response is improvements. Operational response activities are improved by incorporating lesson learns from current and previous detection or response activities. So if there is um, an event that occurs that once the once the once it has been detected and responded to and the event is no longer in place and recovery operations is have began, um, there should be an after actions review, a post postmortem, lessons learned, whatever we want to call it, but where everybody that was involved in the incident sits down and they go over the major topics of, you know, what actually did happen? You know, we had this event and then these are the things that happened and what went well, you know, what did the, how did the incident response team respond um, what went well what were the good things that we did that we should continue doing moving forward and then also what are some improvements um, improvements could be you know our phone tree wasn't updated and so you know not everybody everybody's phone number on the incident response team was incorrect so making sure we have an updated phone tree uh, a big thing with that is is during the improvements phase you want to make sure if you there's an improvement that we just don't identify a problem but we try to also find a solution on how to resolve that problem because it's too easy for somebody to be like oh this was messed up or you know you should do this different but if you don't provide positive feedback for that then you're really just complaining and adding to the problem and so the last function recover three categories and the first one is recovery planning uh, recovery processes and procedures are executed and maintained to ensure timely restoration of systems and assets affected by the cybersecurity event uh, these could be considered your RTO return uh, time objectives or RPOs uh, identifying those different things uh, the second one being improvements, recovery planning and processes are improved. Um, going into the lessons learned, you could do a specific, you could do a specific um, respond after actions review or lessons learned or postmortem, or you could roll them all together if you if you really wanted to. Just as long as you understand that after we do these lessons learned that anything that's identified that needs to be updated is incorporated into the <clears throat> into the incident response plan and that it's disseminated out to all the pertinent personnel that have that need to understand what to do in the event of a cybersecurity event and then communications um, we restore rest uh, we restore activities and they're coordinated with internal and external parties if you have um, third party vendors that you provide services to or even if it's third party service providers to you being able to talk to them uh, such coordinating uh, centers internet service providers um, victims or anything like that who's going to be the face of the company, um, media relations, if we think about back to Target or um, since that was a while ago, you know, who is the person who's going to be the face of Target explaining, you know, there was an incident, 
but you know it wasn't really our fault but our customers were affected by it and we're doing everything that we can to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future all right so this one sort of gives you a breakdown of, of exactly um, what the framework looks like in the different categories uh, i review i did a high level overview of each one of those uh, but if you go onto the NIST website, this is what you're going to see uh, when it gets broken down. It also uh, has uh, some mapping frameworks after the categories. It'll say, you know, in this identify section, you know, this is mapped to COVID um, or ISO 27001, whichever one it's mapped to. And it goes through a variety of different ones like that. All right. So why are we having changes to the NIST cybersecurity framework? Well, sort of like how we explain that every year we need to, you know, review our policies and procedures, our incident response plan, you know, NIST is doing the same thing. It's been a lot longer than a year, but they're doing some refinements and clarifications of version 1.0. And it's based on feedback from people that actually use the, uh, the framework. They're saying, you know this is confusing or i don't understand this or we should add this in here so public and private sector input led to the changes and then it also evolved because you know the threats that we had back in 2014 are not necessarily the exact same threats that we have in 2018 and we need to evolve our planning and risk strategies as you know the threat landscape um, evolves as well <clears throat> so the first change that uh, is the first change that we're going to talk about is auth authentication and identity and the language of the access control category has been redefined to better account for authentic authentication authorization and identity proofing uh, this includes adding one sat subcategory for each authentication and i for authentication and identity proofing and also the category has been re renamed to identity management and access control to better re represent the scope of the category and responding subcategories all right the second one is the self-assessing cybersecurity risk. So they added a section 4.0 self-assessing cybersecurity risk with the framework to explain how the framework can be used by organizations to understand and assess their cybersecurity risk, including the risks of me measurements, because a lot of times, you know, you don't necessarily have um, an agency coming out to audit you specifically to NIST, you can have uh, you can have the guidelines to understand. Hey, this is what I need to be working on, um, and then have another organization come out and assist you with it with filling it out, identifying the different um, categories and functions, and if necessary, um, do a specified. Um, NIST cybersecurity. There's nothing that says you have to do all 102 subcategories. It's not a regulation. It's a um, it's a best practice or a guideline. So um, it's not advised to you know maybe skip some of them that you're like all right I know I'm going to be deficient in these so let's just skip these. But completing the entire assessment and understanding, all right, this truly does apply to my organization versus, all right, this does not apply um, as long as we don't implement any new technologies or processes that would affect this, then we can consider this not applicable to our environment. Uh, so the next one is managing cybersecurity in the supply chain. Um, it's an expanded section of 3.3, uh, communicating cybersecurity requirements with stakeholders 
helps users better understand the cyber, the cyber supply chain risk management. Uh, the objective should be to make the best buying decision among multiple suppliers, giving a carefully determined list of cybersecurity requirements. Uh, this is best described as due diligence. Um, often this means some degree of trade-off comparing multiple products or services with known gaps to the target profile. Once a product or service is purchased, the profile can be used to track and address residual, residual cybersecurity risk. Um, for example, if the service or product purchase did not meet all the objectives described in the target profile, the organization can address the residual risk through other management actions. The profile uh, also should provide the organization a method for assessing if the product meets cybersecurity outcomes through periodic review and testing mechanisms. Uh, the new section 3.4, uh, the buying decisions, highlights use of the framework and understanding risk associated with commercial off-the-shelf products and services. Uh, additional cybersecurity chain risk management or SCRM, since everybody in IT loves all these acronyms, we might as well just throw another one in there. Um, that those criteria were added to the implement, implementation tiers. And then finally, a, a, a supply chain risk management category, including multiple sat, subcategories, uh, has been added to the framework core. <clears throat> All right, this is, this is really short. It, there wasn't a lot of information from NIST about this one, but it's vulnerability disclo disclosure, and it's the subcategory related to the vulnerability disclosure life cycle was added. So going with this, um, once a vulnerability is discovered, having a being able to communicate that throughout your organization saying, hey, this is uh, a vulnerability that was identified, and then these are the steps that we're going to take to try to resolve this um, this vulnerability, or this is a vulnerability that will never go away, and these are the controls that we have in place to mitigate our risks. All right, so what does this all mean? So the changes, <coughs> the changes in the framework, um, they change in their threats. And what that really means is, I said it earlier that in 2014, when the framework was established, that we had, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think back to 2014, and that it's difficult to think of all the different uh, things that were happening in the world at the time. But changes in the framework means that we've identified that an additional threats are in the threat landscape that might not necessarily been prevalent in years before, like ransomware and phishing weren't um, the a high means of trying to uh, gain access to an organization. I recently saw, well, not recently, maybe it was like a week or two ago, uh, that a student sent a phishing email to his teacher and one of the teachers actually clicked on it and then he was able to eventually get um, admin access and was going in and changing his grades. So it goes back from trying to actually, you know, 10, 20 years ago, getting into the computer or even further back, you know, changing that F into an A, adding the leg onto it or whatever it is. Um, it changes. In 2018, we have students crafting phishing emails that look so credible that, you know, teachers are clicking on it and granting access to whatever privileges that they have. And then it goes into the school district as well. You know, what kind of training has the, the district put out to their, their teachers and their faculty to, to be aware of different, you know, phishing attacks or social engineering, you know, unauthorized access. They do the fire drills, active shooter, different things like that. 
but are they doing training with um, specific to cybersecurity threats? So it's different questions like these that are brought up during the assessment phase of this and will definitely help out an organization. And when's the last time you conducted a risk assessment? If you are an organization that works with credit card holder data, that answer should be, you know, at least yearly, you should be doing a PCI, either a self-assessment questionnaire or a PCI ROC, a report on compliance. Um, also with healthcare data, um, HIPAA standards, uh, HIPAA high trust, you know, making sure that you're staying compliant each year protecting patients data but really it's whatever your organization has data is data it doesn't matter if it's credit card data if it's hipaa data patient data personal information or just proprietary information uh, it needs to be protected and the nist cybersecurity um, framework assists in that as well these are some of the resources that were used uh, to craft this presentation. As I said, nist.gov is the easiest one. That's their official website. Uh, if you click on it, I promise you it's not a phishing email. So uh, we're not trying to fish you on this or anything like that when the presentation goes through. And the next one is my contact information. Uh, pretty simple, pretty easy. And then if anybody had any questions, Awesome, Kyle. Thank you so much. Great job. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for uh, joining us today, too. So we're going to open it up to questions now. So if you have any questions, again, you can go ahead and either put it into the public chat or you can also put it into located uh, next to the chat feature in that same window pane. So uh, we do have one question that came in, Kyle, that I'll throw out to you here. And it's actually this is a good question because I think and I'd like to get your feedback on this. The question is, if they're going through the process of implementing it or assessing against this framework, do they have to go in order of those different uh, functions which really drive those categories and subcategories? Um, no, you don't have to necessarily go in order. While the order does sort of, it, it, it is sort of important. Uh, you want to identify the things before you try to respond to anything. It, they put it in um, a chronological way. I have assets, I identified what my assets are, what I need to do to protect them, um, what are the things that I use to detect any cybersecurity events or anything that happens to these um, devices or you know, even facilities that are being identified and protected, how are, they, how are things implemented, and then what do I do to respond and then recover if an event ever happens. So they don't necessarily have to go in order. It does help to to go in order, but as I said earlier, uh, you don't have to necessarily use every single subcategory. You can do a specific one. You you could say, you know what, I'm going to only do a NIST risk assessment that addresses identity. I'm gonna just do that one category, and then all right, once I done once I've done that, maybe I'll focus on the protection phase. So um, you can do it in whatever order you want, but it's suggested to go in the order that NIST is outlined originally. Sure, which also makes sense. Uh, we have another question that came in from Frank. Will the NIST cybersecurity framework be rolled into NIST special publication 800-82 for the ICS arena, which ICS, I guess, is industrial control systems uh, and the security around that? Kyle, I don't know if you have any feedback on that. I, I don't know the answer to that question, honestly, because I'm not sure what NIST is going to do next. But I would tend to think at this point in time, probably not, since they just came out with this latest revision um, a month ago. And this was really designed for those critical infra infrastructure systems, um, government entities, et cetera. But it's really kind of that prioritized approach. And as you kind of addressed in an earlier slide, a cost-effective type of approach. Not to say that 800-82 isn't, but do you have any feedback on on that? And I know you probably can't speak for NIST either, but. Yeah, like looking at that and the research that I did on NIST, I didn't see it, see anything specifically outlining or talking about 800-82. 
Um, but yeah, that, that could be a follow up thing that we can, um, we can incorporate into the slide deck or a follow up with a blog or something since Frank brought it up. That's a good question though. Yeah, and I think, you know, in kind of looking through this here, you know, my understanding is that the cybersecurity framework is really supposed to be applicable to a variety of different industries, right? Whether that's, they've talked about it being uh, important for critical infrastructure and government entities, but also being able to apply it across financial institutions and healthcare and whatnot, whereas 800-82 looks very specific for those industrial control systems, you know, SCADA systems. Uh, programmable, programmable logic controllers, things of that nature, which is very, very specific in terms of the application. So we'll definitely get an answer to that, Frank, a, a, a follow-up answer in terms of um, if that's going to roll out. I'm not sure if we will be able to get that necessarily just because we're not sure what NIST is going going to or not going to do, but we'll, we'll do the best that we can and get uh, a response over to you. Um, uh, William had a question in regards to documentation mapping NIST to the SANS controls, uh, which is actually what we did for last month's webinar on the changes to the top 20 critical security controls. So I don't know if that's something necessarily that we have. I'm sure that it's out there. I know that our policy and procedures map to both. Um, is there, and maybe I can take this offline with you, William, but if, if there's something specific that you're looking for uh, in terms of documenting, are you looking about documenting the subcategories to the specific controls? You probably can't answer because your mic is muted, so I'll, I'll take it <laughs> offline with you. I just remember that we muted everybody, um, but we'll take that. Uh, I'll get back in contact with you uh, after yeah. this to make if sure we answer that. Go, when you go into the in onto the NIST um, website and you click on frameworks of 1.1, uh, at the at the end of it, it'll say informative references, and it's mapped to COBIT 5, um, CIS, CSC1. Uh, ISO 27001, uh, NIST pub, uh, Special Publication 800-53, ISA. Yeah, so I don't see anything in here specifically to SANS, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it can't be. And Kyle, can you just share where that where you found that link again, just so I can I'll, I'll post it in here to the blog, so make sure it's part of the recording in case folks need to uh, want to go and visit that site. I know yeah, said so. so, uh, so what it's in my in my web address right now. It's www.nist.gov slash cyber framework slash new framework um, pound basics or hashtag basics. But once you get into the cybersecurity framework, uh, it'll it'll be on that screen, and you just click on the plus sign that says framework, and then you can either do a PDF or an Excel version of that. Beautiful. All right, cool. So we'll provide that over to you, William, uh, and get that over to you to make sure that um, we have everything that we need to. So I'll open it up one final time here. Any last minute questions that have come in? It doesn't look like anybody else is asking any questions. So um, Kyle, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to prepare the presentation as well as present the presentation, of course. Uh, great stuff. A lot of uh, a lot of change in the cybersecurity and information security world with the uh, critical security controls, and then also now with with NIST. So thank you for taking the time to do this. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for jumping on and spending uh, some time, especially the first day back after a long weekend. So appreciate you spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, again, we will be uh, making the recording of the webinar available to folks, and then also a copy of the presentation as well. Um, and that will come out, uh, as I mentioned, later this afternoon to everybody. So uh, stay tuned. Next month, we're going to be talking about another uh, hot topic in the world of compliance, and that's GDPR, uh, which just came into effect last Friday. So we'll be presenting uh, on that as well, since we'll be a month into it. So look for that to come out uh, in the next week or two uh, for the end of June. So thanks again, everybody. Appreciate you taking the time, and have a great rest of your Tuesday.